Cedar Street, again, I love you very, very much. It's a joy of my heart to be with you here this morning, and it's good to be in God's house. We had a wonderful uh, missions breakfast. I thank all those that were in attendance. If you missed it, that's okay. Uh, What we talked about as far as that conference, uh, I'm going to be mentioning it over and over and having us pray and really seek the Lord, because I think God wants to do a mighty work in this community, and I think He wants to use this church as a lighthouse to do it. Amen? Amen. I really believe that. There's a lot of great churches in Candler County, and God's working in all of them. But I also think he's got a special work for us here. So if you are just joining us, or maybe again, it's been a little while since you've been in here at that house down on Cedar Street, uh, we are in our final week of a sermon series entitled, Who's Your One? Who's Your One? And I've been challenging all of us, myself included, to have one person Okay, choose one person that God puts on your heart and mind, and that one person is someone that you're going to pray for, someone that you're going to encourage, and that's someone that you're going to in some way share your faith with. Now, I want to say without mentioning names that uh, there have, I can think of at least three people that have come up to me privately and said, you know what, God is doing a work right now as I pray. I'm seeing the one that I'm praying for ask questions. I'm seeing them do certain things. I, you know, I'm just grateful because every week, if you're a visitor here, maybe in the the church that you attend, uh, certainly at this church, I feel a burden to share God's calling on our life to be great commission Christians, that we are sharing our faith, that we're making disciples, that we're doing all these things. But so sometimes you hear that from a pastor and, and you feel the weight of that. You say, where do I start? And God says, listen, the only thing I'm asking you to do is one person. Pray for them. When you have opportunities, encourage them. And then look for an opening to share your faith. Okay, That might include inviting them to come to church. It may be just telling them what God did in your life. And yes, it also may be sharing the gospel and the plan of salvation and how they too can become a Christian. That Jesus lived for us, that he died for us, that he rose for us, that he ascended to heaven for us, and that he's coming back again to make all things new. One person. And if each of us dedicated our time to at least one person, which is the bare minimum of what God is really calling us to in the Great Commission, I've said it before, I'll say it again, this church and this community will never be the same again. So we've talked about in our sermon series, one reality that uh, we're all going to go to one place, heaven or hell, and there's nothing in between. We've talked about one path that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will get to heaven and get to the Father except through Him. We've talked about one call, okay, as he called his disciples to follow him. That call is a call of surrender. We throw our hands up and say, God, I'm yours. And then last week, we talked about one desire. We said that the one main desire that we have in this world of brokenness is to be restored. And even non-Christians who don't know and have never thought about it and don't know the answer in Jesus, they too are still crying out to be restored, We're crying out for physical restoration from sickness and disease and death. We're calling out for spiritual restoration to be restored in a relationship with God. We are calling for emotional restoration for our relationships with other people to be put back together. Only Jesus does that. Only Jesus does that. So we're in our final final sermon of the series, and the one this morning is entitled One Sheep. So it's been one reality, one path, one call, one desire, and And we're going to close it out with one sheep as we look at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. And you know, I thought about this last Sunday night. So last Sunday night, we were digging into the very beginning of a a series on revival called Seeking Him. Last Sunday night was our second week in that series. And the the lady who's a phenomenal Bible teacher, Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, she walked us through the idea of the word humility. Okay, the word humility. And when she mentioned the word humility, she mentioned the root word of that. And that's a word called humus. We get the word human being from the word humus, and humus means earth or dirt. And the reason we do that is because guess what? That's what we're made of. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that we come from the dust of the earth. 
All right, Adam was made out of dust and God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living being in the image of God. So here's the image that I had in my mind. All right, I think we need to look at humanity in two ways. We have true humility when we see that on one side of the coin, we're nothing but dust. All right, to dust we came and to dust we shall return is what the Bible says. On the other side of that coin, we're made in the image of God. We are called to be a reflection of who God is. We're called to have deep connecting relationships in a way that no other creature on planet earth has. And most of all, and I love this quote from the great, late, uh, late great philosopher Dallas Willard, we are unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. So when you're made in the image of God, does it mean that you're a mirror? Yes. Does it mean you have logic and reasoning and you have deep relationship? Yes. But at a root foundational level, to be made in the image of God means, unlike other creatures, you're an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Now stop and think about this. We can have humility when we remind ourselves about the the front of that coin, that we're just dust. But we can also have a fervent love for God and for others when we look at the other side of that coin and see every single person that we look at has infinite worth made in the image of a holy God because they're eternal, unceasing spiritual beings that have an eternal destiny. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. I don't care about your worst enemy. If that's a human being, they're made in the image of God and they have infinite worth. And we need to see other people that way to know that God in his love would give them his image. All human beings have infinite worth. So what's our main idea as we walk into Luke 15? Here it is. Jesus declares the infinite worth of one sheep as a human soul made in the image of God. Jesus declares the infinite worth of one sheep as a human soul made in the image of God. So if you want to know about the worth of just one sheep, would you join me by turning to the book of Luke in chapter 15? We'll be in Luke chapter 15, third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, then Luke. We're on page 1039 in your pew Bible. If you don't have a Bible, grab your pew Bible in front of you or beside you. Again, page 1039 in your pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time. Out of the reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and fully sufficient word, we are in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1 and moving our way through the parable to verse 7. Hear God's word to us through his servant Luke. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you that you are here and that you love me and that you love us. And I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with your image, a blessing that certainly we are not worthy of, but that you place worth on us by your love alone. I thank you for every person in this room. They're all unceasing spiritual beings that have an eternal destiny in your universe. And so, Father, I pray that we would consider the infinite worth of every human soul this morning, certainly who we are, made in your image, and those that we minister to that you love more than we can put into words. Father, I pray for your grace and the power of your spirit for the anointing of every word that is preached, that all the praise, honor, and glory would be yours and yours alone. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, amen. Amen. So Luke chapter 15 is not only a great parable that we're going to look at in verses 1 through 7. It's a great chapter. By the way, the Bible is a great book. I didn't know if you knew that. But Luke 15, 
Jesus is very strategic, and he says three parables in this chapter, back to back to back, that all kind of have the same theme, that all kind of go in the same flow and in the same rhythm, all right? In verses 1 through 7 that we're going to look at this morning, it's the parable of the lost sheep. Then in verses 8 through 10, it's the parable of the lost coin. There's a woman that has 10 silver coins, and she can't find one, and guess what she does? She turns it upside down, just like y'all do when you can't find the clicker. All right, they're vacuuming under the carpet, looking everywhere for that clicker, and it's probably between the couch cushions, right? And then in verses 11 through 32, it's about a lost son. Perhaps you know the parable well, the prodigal of, or the, the parable of the prodigal son, which, by the way, is going to be the uh, men's Bible study that we have that starts on Thursday at 6.15, so we're looking forward to having you come be a part of that. Um, so what do all three of these parables teach? Well, they teach threefold. We are lost. God seeks after us, and God rejoices when we are found. Okay, let me say that again. We are lost, God seeks after us, and God rejoices when we are found. And we're going to look at that and starting in verses 1 through 7 as we see Jesus Christ pursuing sinners as a good shepherd who's going after lost sheep. And again, I want to remind us, I want us to be thinking about this as we walk through the text God is wanting us to understand these things, that we are of infinite worth because we're made in the image of God, and God loves us, and on a rescue effort is seeking to save us, and for those that come to saving faith, on every single one, he rejoices out of his steadfast love. So let us look at this together. Let's look at these three responses to the infinite worth of one sheep. Number one, let's look at reaching out to one sheep. Now, in verses 1 through 2, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, I want to stop right there and make a statement before we look at the text. Now, it says that Jesus is receiving sinners to himself, but Jim Savage made a great point in our missions breakfast. Jesus does say, Come to me, but he says that out of response of going to them first. Okay? Jesus came to us in a rescue effort. He is Emmanuel who came and put on flesh and dwelt among us and humbled himself to be a suffering servant, all right? And he lived 30 years as a vocational carpenter, and he became one of us. He cried and laughed and slept and and, and went through all the things that we go through, okay? He experienced humanity, and he did that to come after us, all right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life, right? He came to us first, in the form of a human being, carpenter from Nazareth. But now as he's walking and preaching all over Palestine in this three-year earthly ministry, out of his rescue effort for them, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're starting to come to him. And as they're coming to him, the Pharisees are noticing this and saying, who is this Jesus? He's supposed to be a holy man, but everybody he's breaking bread with ain't so holy. How is this working out? And this is what they say. They, They have these charges against him. First, that he receives sinners, but then that he eats with them. So let me mention those two words. First, it says Christ receives sinners. All right, some of you may have different translations. Some says welcomes. Others say it takes them in. Uh, Some would say he associates with them. I'm going to use my own version, okay, the BSV, the Bo Standard Version. I like the word embrace because I think it encompasses receive, but a whole lot more. Jesus embraced sinners, Did he see their sin? You better believe it. Did he embrace them just to pat them on the back and tell them they're fine where they are and continue living the way they're living? No. But he embraced them because he saw God's image on them and their infinite worth and their need to be saved and his mission to bring them to salvation. He received them. Now, why do the Pharisees have a problem with this? Well, I want you to think for just a moment. If you're, not, if you're new to the Bible, or maybe these are areas that you're a little bit cloudy, Pharisees and scribes, they're the teachers and scholars of the Jewish law. Well, in the Old Testament, we see in, in uh, prophets like Jeremiah, we see that Israel was banned for 70 years in an exile in Babylon. And, and the enemies burned down the temple, and they ruined basic Jewish life in Jerusalem and the holy city, and they were banished for 70 years in Babylon. And God said, you're going to be there 70 years, but your children and your children's children, they're going to come back and rebuild the city. And we see in Nehemiah and Ezra, they come back, they rebuild the temple and the wall, and the holy city of Jerusalem is established. Now, the Pharisees come along, 
And they say, we're going to make sure that we don't get banished because of our disobedience again. So the Pharisees actually start off with good intentions. They say, we're going to take the Old Testament, the laws of Moses in the first five books of the Bible, and we're going to write these commentaries and add laws to them so that we don't break any law so that God doesn't punish us by sending us away for 70 years. Good intentions, but not good theology. Because here's what they did. If the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy... They said, okay, to keep the Sabbath day holy, we're only going to have 70 steps that you can take to the synagogue and 70 steps that you can come home and you can't heal on the Sabbath, you can't do this on the Sabbath, you can't, and they started adding all these laws. That's called legalism. Legalism is when we add to the laws of God things to earn that we cannot earn, mostly our righteousness. That's a gift of God's grace. So one of the things that they learned in the Old Testament was to be careful about who you keep your company with. All right, in uh, Psalm 1.1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor sits in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And Proverbs 1.15 says, Do not walk in the way of sinners, hold back your foot from their paths. So there's a lot of Old Testament passages that say, Do not keep company with sinners. But what the Bible is saying is, Do not spend all of your time with people who will influence you to do what they do. What the Bible does not say is close your doors to them and not invite them into your home and into your life. Because if you're following Christ and they're not, how are they going to see who Christ is if your door is closed? All right, so the Pharisees didn't understand this. You can invite sinners into your life without imitating their lifestyle. You can be the salt and light for them. And that's exactly what the Pharisees missed. Now, not only did Jesus embrace them, it also says that he ate with them. All right, that is table fellowship. And if that is a word I want to use, that word is intimacy. I don't know if you know this, but your relationship with another person will change just like that if you have them over your house for dinner just one time. The moment that you gather around the table and break bread with someone, you enter into a new relationship with them. I've been waiting 10 years for that relationship with Annie Jean Crooms, and it just ain't happened yet. (laughs) This is just your pastor wanting to have an intimate fellowship with you, Miss Annie Jean. (laughs) All all jokes aside, all jokes aside, it is a very special thing. Even in 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 the missions breakfast, why do we eat before we talked? Not just because it's good to eat, and Baptists love to eat, and a casserole dish is part of our statement of faith. No, it's because we knew that that would create a bond. Conversations happen over food. The soul is nourished when the body is nourished, and Jesus had them around the table. In fact, I'll never forget this. I was on vacation about six or seven years ago in Ocean City, New Jersey, and I ducked into a Baptist church, and a pastor said something. It's just one of those phrases in a sermon that sticks with you. He said, Jesus takes all the Old Testament altars of blood sacrifice and he turns them into the New Testament tables of fellowship. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore to appease God and and have our sins forgiven and blood atoned for. No, Jesus takes care of that. Now we can dine at the table as adopted children in the family of God. Jesus dines with sinners. He eats with them. He breaks bread with them. He welcomes them into his world, and he's not worried that they're going to corrupt him. He wants to make sure that he changes them. That's our calling, too. That's our calling, too. Before I move on to point two, I want to say this. How can you reach out and embrace someone in your life who doesn't know Jesus Christ? Can I just be plain and simple? Have them over your house for dinner. Let them see your family Bible sitting on the coffee table. All right, let them see all the Bible verses you have hanging up in the kitchen. But most of all, let them see Jesus in you. Break bread with them. Listen to them. Ask them how they're doing. Pray for them. You're not preaching to them. You're welcoming them into your world so they can see what a Christian looks like. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he calls us to do as we reach out to one sheep. Number two, not only do we reach out to one sheep, we run after one sheep. All right, running after one sheep, verses three through four. But he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? The shepherd gathered around his flock has one that is lost and will stop at nothing to find the one. Now, I meditated on this for seven solid days. 
Why would a good shepherd leave 99 sheep in the fold and go after one lost one? Let me give you a couple thoughts. I think, first, because that shepherd has an understood value of every sheep. He cares about the numbers because he cares about the one. A shepherd knows that every single sheep is important and his job is to look after every single one of them. The second is the steadfast love of the shepherd, that he has a love and a care for every sheep in his fold. If he didn't, he wouldn't be a good shepherd. The song that Jody led us in this morning, Reckless Love, he says, his love chases us down and fights till we're found. Do you know that's the love of the Father? That's the love of God who's looking after you right now with steadfast love. I said this morning to our missions committee, the Bible says that the whole earth is covered in the steadfast love of God, and he wants you to receive that through Christ. And so he goes after you. There are some of you in this room right now, you have no idea how God has been pursuing you. You have no clue the people he's putting in your path. You have no clue right now that you're sitting where you're sitting and you're listening to the words that you're hearing because you, he wants those words to filter into your soul. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. You can only receive it by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And you're here today because God foreordained for you to be sitting where you're at and receiving that because you think you need something else, but what you need is be, to be transformed by the love of God. That's the love of a good shepherd. And finally, the mission of the shepherd. The mission of a shepherd is to look after his whole fold, and until all the sheep are in the fold, the shepherd's mission is not complete. If you want to know why Jesus himself has not come back yet to make all things new, is because he's waiting for more sheep to come into the fold. And that's why we need to be the ones to go after them. That's a good shepherd running after sheep. Now, here's something else I thought about, and this applies to us at this church. I did a lot of research, and I thought, how is it that a shepherd who loves every single sheep could actually leave 99 of them and go after the one? Well, I found two things to make me think. The first is, when the 99 are together as one flock, all right, there's a protection there. There's a strength there. Because what, what, this, what Satan wants to do is separate the flock, but there's strength when the flock is together. And guess what that flock is? The church. God intended for you to be part of his flock because you just will not know his strength. You just will not experience his power if all you're doing is reading your Bible a few minutes a day and not being a part of a local church. I hear it all the time. Well, I didn't get to church, but I watched Charles Stanley this morning. Well, great. Charles Stanley's a faithful teacher, and he's a good shepherd of his church, but you're not a member of his church. His church members don't encourage you and support you and call you and bring food to you when you're mourning and weep with those who weep and, and walk with you. You need a local church. All right, those pastors on TV, they're not a, they may be a supplement, but they don't take the place of being a part of a local church. You need to be part of the fold the second part is this. I didn't know this until I studied it this week. That in most of these open countries, there were multiple shepherds overseeing the flock and actually multiple flocks so that when one shepherd would leave, he knew that he could entrust that flock to the rest of the shepherds. Guess how that applies to us? Having multiple elders in one church that oversee a flock. You want to know why so many churches are rising and falling in Candler County and beyond? Because they're built on the talent of one man. And that should not be. How many times have you seen a pastor leave and the church dies? Because the church was relying on one person instead of carrying the weight together. And I love you too much, uh, Cedar Street. I really do. If I were to, to do a good work here for many years, and then after I leave, the things would fall apart, that means that I did not do my job to disciple and to shepherd and to equip and that's why I'm praying as we start a new sermon series next month in Titus that we continue to consider having multiple elders. And I'm not saying, um, you know, I think, I think we do have in our church men who are qualified to be those men, but they need to have the time and the availability to be able to study and pray and help me oversee the flock. I want this church to be around for my daughter, and if I ever have grandkids, my grandchildren. I want to raise my family at Cedar Street Baptist Church. I've been here 10 years, and this church has meant more to me than I know how to put into words. And so I really believe that's how a good shepherd could leave the 99 and go to the one because there's other good shepherds looking after the flock. That's running after the sheep. 
And finally, number three, so reaching out to one sheep, running after one sheep. Third and finally, rejoicing in one sheep. In verses five through seven, we see the shepherd has found the sheep. Just like in the other parables, they find what they're looking for and they respond in a certain way. So let me just start with our, our parable here in Luke 15. In verses five through six, it says basically when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. So the shepherd does a good work and once the sheep is found, he's fully embraced in the moment. He's fully rejoicing in that one found sheep. And Jesus says to the Pharisees in the crowd, if you don't get this, I got two more parables for you. A woman that had 10 coins and she lost one and she turned the house upside down looking for it like the clicker. Well, she found it and guess what she did? It says in verse nine, when she had found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. And then finally, that parable that we all know and love, the, the prodigal son in verses 20 through 24, we see the father running after the prodigal son. That's the most important part of that whole parable. As the son is coming home, the father drops everything and runs after him. And this is what he says. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Why? Because he understood the value of his child. He understood the value of one sheep. And if we didn't get at all that, I think the, 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 the whole chapter can be summarized in verse seven. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Let me make this practical. About two years ago, Dave Chambers, Jim Savage, and myself went to the Georgia Baptist State Mission Board meeting and we listened to a man stand up and pound the pulpit and I think his heart was in the right place. And he was pounding it over and over that there's, there's less than two baptisms, baptisms a year in Southern Baptist life and we're dying as a denomination and no one cares and no one's reaching the lost. And I could see the burden in his heart. And I was overwhelmed with this thought when I was preparing this message. We do not need another evangelism strategy. They're helpful, but they're not the problem. We need to do two things. We need to spend more time experiencing the presence of God so that his love unites us. We abide in him and he in us and our heart starts to desire the things that his heart desires, mainly that lost people are found. And the second thing we need to do when even one person is found, we need to know how much that means to God and we need to really celebrate and rejoice in that. I don't care about numbers. Now, numbers are not unimportant. They tell a tale, okay? If you're at a church and the numbers go down five or six straight years, there's something probably not right there that needs to be fixed, okay? Maybe there's outreach issues. Maybe there's the discipleship issues. I don't know, okay? Churches always do this. Even ours has done this over the years. But instead of just worrying about that Southern Baptist report that Miss Ruth has to fill out every year and how many baptisms we had and wonder and worry, are we gonna have enough this year to see like we're a growing church? No, let's... Let's celebrate. Let's do the best we can to pray, encourage, and share, spend time with God and fall in love with Christ all over again to let his love move us to love other people. And if we have one baptism this year, and I already know a few that we're gonna have who've come to me and asked, that we take time and celebrate that a sinner has turned from his or her sins and the gates of heaven are shaking with excitement and joy. If we're gonna pray one at a time, if we're gonna encourage one at a time, if we're gonna share one at a time, we need to really start rejoicing one at a time. We really do. And understand the value of one sheep. So let me sum this up. When we remember the infinite worth of one sheep, we must take one step to share Christ with one person. Okay? When we remember the infinite worth of one sheep, we must take one step to share Christ with one person. Okay? Simple, not easy, but simple. You've been listening for five weeks now about the call of reaching out to the lost. And, and maybe you felt the burden. I feel it as I'm preparing the sermons. I'm thinking, Lord, I, I could do better. I know I could do better. But God has been convicting me. Bo, don't worry about strategies. Bo, don't worry about numbers. I put one person on your heart. Pray for them. 
when you see them and I put them in your path or you have an opportunity to go knocking on their door, encourage them. As I open up more opportunities, share with them. And when, you, when, when I'm working through you, tell them how you came to know Jesus Christ and how they can come to know Christ as well. All right, we need to slow down, be with the Lord, let his love come in us and through us. And we need to start looking at every human soul, even the difficult ones, which some people probably consider us the difficult ones, if you stop and think about that, and understand the value of a human being made in the image of God, that God gave them the highest honor he could give. He didn't give that honor to, to animals, Okay? They're beautiful creatures, but they're not made in God's image. They can't relate to you the way a human being can. They don't have a deep, abiding relationship. They can't do your taxes, make a budget, uh, have long-term conversations with you. And they, you know, as much as they are a gift, they're not human beings. They don't have an eternal destiny in God's great universe. We do. And so does every human being God's going to put in your path the next six days. Be awake and be aware. And as we close this sermon series, just remember the power of one. All right, we have one reality. We're going to go to heaven or hell. We have one path to get there. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one call. That's to surrender our lives. We have one desire. That's for all of us to be restored. And there's one sheep that God has given us right now, just one. Pray for them. Encourage them. Share with them. And as we draw into a time of invitation, if you yourself have been that lost sheep and you've wandered into the flock here this morning, you're in the right place. You confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and know the good shepherd wants to throw you over his shoulders and rejoice with the kingdom of God that you have repented and placed your faith in him. You do that as we sing, and you let me know how I can pray and minister to you, and it would be my honor because God has put on my heart, as I pray he puts on yours, the value of one sheep. Let's pray. Father, again, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, your, your image that you place on us, the, the, the infinite worth that we certainly cannot earn and we did not deserve. So, Lord, I pray that you press that in even deeper. Help us to truly understand what it means to be made in your image, to have infinite worth as unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in your great universe. Father, help us to see that in other people. Help us to minister to them, to love them, to pray for them, to go after them the way a good shepherd goes after a lost sheep. And I thank you for the fold here at Cedar Street. I thank you for the wonderful shepherds that have overseen this flock for so many years. And I thank you that when I was lost, not only did Jesus find me, but that he saw fit that I would gather in the flock here at Cedar Street. I thank you for this church and all that you're doing, Father. And I pray that you would continue to do it for your glory and for our joy. In Christ's name, amen.